Welcome back, viewers. Jumping back into the fray here with John Ling. Good morning. Good evening. How are you, John? Hey, good day, Louis. Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm well and you. I'm doing just fine. And I want to start off by maybe going back a little bit to the episode before last where we were talking about the faithful Catholics' obligation toward non-infallible teachings that are put forth by the Holy Father. And we talked about firm mental assent and such. And I have a quote in front of me that one of our readers would like a little bit more clarity on. It comes from Father Benedict Merkelbach in a work that he produced in 1935. And it reads, quote, Where the church does not teach with infallible authority, the proposed doctrine is not of itself irreformable. That's why, if per accidens in a hypothesis, albeit very rarely, after the most careful examination, there seems to be a very grave reason against the proposed teaching. It would be licit, without temerity, to suspend internal assent, end quote. And I really would like to just have some more insight on that and specifically find out how does that apply to what takes place today very typically among traditionalists, where we uh, just routinely suspend assent to teachings that come forth from the Pope simply because they're not infallible. Yeah, and and and, and that is very much a um, an artifact of this era. Um, you you just can't imagine the attitude that that most people have to the Holy Father being manifest in, in any other period in the history of the Church. So even those historical cases where the Pope was challenged, um, uh, sometimes by saints. Um, on a doctrinal matter or, or, or on an act that had some sort of doctrinal implication, you know, St. Paul confronting St. Peter. The, the idea that you would have to deal with that on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis is just inconceivable. Um, it's, it just doesn't... Uh, that What we're facing is unprecedented, like it, totally unprecedented. So what is that... The, the real question is, you know, what is that... Um, that firm mental assent or, you know, um, so the way the theologians talk about it, um, for, for a start, a mental assent to a proposition, you've got to remember this is the, this is the intellect that's doing this, okay, so this is not a question of the will, although the will is involved. Um, uh, it's involved uh, in a secondary way, if you like, because what's in view in this question is, is, um, is the intellect seeing that something's true. Now, in matters of faith uh, which are outside of natural theology, so matters of, of pure revelation, um, you know, such as the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, you know, it's something we can't know by reason, even if we're Aristotle. Um, uh, those, the, the motive of, of belief is not that we see that, the proposition itself must be true, like we do that we see the proposition. So, if you've been down the path of studying St. Thomas's um, uh, five ways, you know, any good proof of the existence of God, when you get the proof, you see it. It's, 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 it's literally like your eyes focus on something comes into focus, and for the first time, you really see it. That type of proof, um, well, that, that, a proof of the existence of God, if it's valid, will give you that vision and you'll see that the proposition God exists has to be true. It, it's true. Yeah. It can't be any other way. But with matters of faith, what's happening is, is you are matters purely of faith is you are believing the proposition because of the veracity of the teacher. Now, ultimately of God, right? So in the case of, of a proposition which is presented in a teaching act which is not itself um, definitely infallible, you can't have that degree of certitude. You're not, it's not like believing God. You know, when, when, you, when you pronounce the creed, for example, you're believing the church as the infallible witness of the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're really believing God. But um, in, in any encyclical, for example, there are any number of propositions being put which are not being presented with that, that same authority behind them and that same guarantee of truthfulness so that the, the motive of assent 
um, is is not um, God revealing and the church infallibly proposing. Yeah. Um, so the question that the theologians are grappling with, and this is what Merkelbach's, you know, one of the corollaries is what Merkelbach's saying, um, is that is this question of what is the ascent based on? Or what is the intellect grasping onto as a motive for accepting the proposition as true? And the answer is um, the credibility of the church. So we know that the church is, um, you know, that the Holy Ghost is the soul of the church, that, that she's been granted this spirit of truth who will, who will bring her into all truth and show her all that he has taught, etc. as our Lord promised. Um, and therefore she won't... Um, the, the the chance that 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 something uh, not quite true is being presented is 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 regarded as almost a blasphemous inference. You know, um, we're not talking about infallibility. We're talking about this general doctrinal providence that Franzelin talks about, um, which results in 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 what he calls this infallible safety. But going back to the motive of credibility, it, it, it's the it's the credibility of the church rather than um, I shouldn't say rather than the credibility of God, but without the assurance that this is definitely what God has revealed, you know, that God it so does. can't be entirely sure I, that I God Maybe a point of clarity here. Does that so make sense? I think this is a great quote. There's so much in there that we could unearth. But one of the things that jumps out to me is this yep. idea. We're talking about suspending internal assent. So with yes. regard to the question of how it compares to the present day and age and the way in which traditionalists yeah. typically react to things that come forth from Rome today. It, it's no longer internal. John, is it? I mean, we, I, speaking for myself, I, you know, I've, I've blogged thousands upon thousands of words where it's firm external rejection, yeah. <laughs> you know? So we're, we're talking about pretty much apples and oranges, it seems like, when we apply this quote to the present day, do you think? Oh, no, no, no absolutely, that's the case. I agree. Totally chalk and cheese, because... I mean, there are multiple differences between what Merkelbach's describing as licit um, and what we're forced to do in the in the current age on the hypothesis that these men have have been popes. That Francis is pope, for example. Um, but I just want to uh, just 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 finish off the point I was making there. So so the corollary, uh, if the possibility of some error exists, and we're not granting the possibility of dangerous error of heresy or you know. But if the possibility of some error exists, then then there there must be a way of describing what would be lawful to do in that circumstance. And Merkelbach, if I remember correctly, was a canonist and a, and a moralist, which is a common combination, right? Because the you know the moral uh, the moralist is looking at um, obedience to the law, um, and so the canonist is an expert in what the law is. Um, so so anyway, so he he um, he's saying what would be licit, and so he's Okay, who would licitly be able to withhold internal assent? So there's a positive obligation to assent. Um, <laughs> there are good reasons to assent. Uh, in, in a given case, there might be something uh, about the particular expression that – this is why I insist this, this the intellect that's at work here. A particular expression um, – not so much that the theologian who's examining it thinks that it's erroneous, but he can't assent to it. It, it doesn't go home, right, because of other things he already knows about what the church teaches. And he goes, ah, I, I'm unable to assent. That's a better way to see it, right? And so in that case, if there really are good reasons, he, it's licit for him to withhold that internal assent. So see the whole way the question's cast, you know, is it licit to withhold assent? In other words, the obligations to assent, and you're unable to do so in this particular case, right, for very good reasons. Now, that is not going to occur in the case of um, a layman. Now, we're, we're just not well educated enough in the faith. Right? Uh, the case he has in view is, 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 is the case of a theologian. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that the... Uh, the layman would be, you could certainly extend it and say, well, a layman would be, if a, if a theologian's entitled to withhold assent, then, then what about the layman who's friends with the theologian or his student or something? Um, and he knows the same things on that particular question because he's, you know, would he be entitled to withhold assent? Uh, yes, I think morally he could. But again, 
mutatis mutandis, you know, think about our relative position in terms of knowledge and learning and holiness and, you know, we'd be very, very, it, it'd be very fraught uh, for a layman to be, to be doing that. So, again, error of the beard. Uh, this is the rare exception or the rare hypothetical exception because no one seems to ever give a case in which this has occurred uh, in the books. You know what I mean? You, you don't get theologians saying, oh, and in this case, that you know, it, this, this, this would have applied. You just, you just don't see the concrete examples from history and you think, why not? Well, <laughs> maybe because they don't exist. Um, so, so that's... You know that's the that the rare hypothetical example, and then you've got the current situation in, in the exactly. church where, where nobody another, really even respects. Right, another example authority. where it, it really is apples and oranges. We we don't the obligation. To be. Our starting point is not yeah. the obligation to assent. The starting point is let's ferret through this thing to see if there's anything worthy of my assent. No, <laughs> because I know I'm going to encounter things that I simply cannot assent to. <laughs> you know, and and I'm glad you brought up the idea that there's not. It, examples because one yeah. of the things that yeah. occurred to me reading this quote is boy I wish Father Merkelback would have given us some examples of those occasions but they're conspicuously missing as you pointed out yeah, it's just the way it is um, and, and it does make it hard to get your head around what these theologians are talking about if they don't give you examples if you can't or if you can't think of examples um, you know when you read about the development of dogma you can think of examples. You, you can think of examples like the Immaculate Conception, um, and you can think about different, very radically different examples, like papal infallibility, which was held uh, with with no doubt and with perfect clarity in the Middle Ages, and which uh, entered a period of um, obscurity as a result of the Great Western Schism, actually. And, and if you read the Relatio of Bishop Gasser at the at the Vatican Council, when he's explaining to the bishops what the formula means, he makes that point. He said, let's put an end to this period of obscurity, which right. has been torturous for the church, that started with the Great Western Schism. So, so, so you can see, when you're when thinking about uh, the teaching authority of the church, the, the magisterium, and, and the body of doctrine that she proposes, how it's possible, one, to have an inchoate, you know, a, a revealed dogma, which has not yet been given the clarity and, 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 the, and, and the, the additional force of the church's teaching, if you like, to make it clear to all that, no, no, this is, this is a revealed dogma, immaculate conception. You can also see how it's possible for something to become obscured, uh, new questions arise, they all get thrashed out. It might take hundreds of years, and then finally it gets settled with a with a definition. You can see both of those, and then you can see the ordinary magisterium just with something like, um, I don't know, you know, uh, the fact that we've all got a guardian angel or something. All right. So moving on here, I had a another question from a viewer, which I think is pretty interesting. He asked if you can describe and critique the various reactions to the present crisis, and he lists liberals, conservatives. Uh, indult Catholics, SSPX Catholics, set of a contest, and the differences between these particular groups, if you'll allow for the labels. Yeah, so so I think um, it's probably clear from what I've said in, in past talks that that the uh, to my mind the great division is between traditionalists and everybody else. You know, the liberals uh, were people who were enthusiastic before the council. <laughs> Um, for, for change and then when it came along uh, even the changes that weren't there like the abandonment of Latin um, they they, you know enthusiastically pushed anyway uh, I call it the spirit of the council uh, those people aren't Catholics they're, they're not people who are habitually subject to the church and, and waiting to hear what the church teaches so that they can conform their minds to it um, and they're not happy with the teaching of the church they do hear they're, they're wanting to change it Right, so so their mind is above that of the church, and they're, they're not Catholics. There's no subjection to the magisterium. Conservatives are an interesting crew. Um, the, the the conservative reaction to the introduction of the new mass was to go along with it, um, and they regarded the very few, and it was very few worldwide, who 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 couldn't in conscience accept it uh, as as nuts, you know, and. Um, you know that this reform 
you, you sort of wonder whether those people could have seen any reform as impossible. You know, they could always justify it. And I think that's the, the, the quality of that. And I think the mass probably um, is, is the shibboleth, the, the test that really um, decides against them and against their mentality. There's something wrong there, right? And then we get the traditionalists, and that includes obviously um, the Society of St. Pius the Tenth type people and the and the set of um, and 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 some Indel people. And I say it that way because I think the fundamentally traditionalist outlook, and therefore, and because it's authentically Catholic, is that is that the principle that's uppermost in the mind and was at the time of, of the changes. Um, is holding fast to that which we've received, and and this is found all through the the ancient literature. Of the, you know, it's found in Holy Writ, and it's found in the Fathers. Um, this idea that that novelty is uh, in itself something to be to be avoided, um, and in fact, um, if you read the Fathers and you read the Council, you know, the documents of the Council of Trent, right down to the condemnation of um, of um, one of the condemnations of the 19th century, I can't remember who it was, whether it was Gregory the 16th or Pius the 9th, the term used was innovators. So so calling someone an innovator was enough to discredit them in the eyes of, of, of Christians, yeah? So now not all innovations are wrong, but St. Thomas lays down as a fundamental principle that all change to the law involves evil, entails evil. And and so if you are going to change the law, you can only it's only lawful to do so. It's only moral to change the law if there's a very great good that will be secured from the change, because it will entail some evil. So you better have an overwhelming good, right, that justifies the concomitant evil. So think about that, and then think about the the revolution that was Vatican II. You know that all of this novelty. This flood of novelty, and then the new mass. So the, I think that the, the fundamentally traditionalist outlook is 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 properly Catholic in that it's properly attached to tradition. It's proper properly suspicious of innovation, um, and the the real crunch is is that if you're already bound, you're not allowed to receive the innovation. Right? If it's contrary to something you're bound by, you you're not allowed to. You're not permitted by 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 the law of God. To accept it, and a classic example is religious liberty. We were already bound to reject that because it had been dogmatically condemned, like it was infallibly condemned. Right. And then it's presented as as something we have to accept. And 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 then you know, uh, Professor Tom Pink and and Father Brian Harrison and others have, have tried to justify this as, as not a fundamental change in doctrine. Um, and some of their arguments are good, and some of their arguments are not so good. But but they're missing the point. The Vatican understood that this was the uncrowning of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Vatican Secretary of State went around to all the continuing confessional states, so the, the states that recognised our Lord Jesus Christ as king in their constitutions and renegotiated the concordat that the Vatican had with each of them to get rid of that from their constitution. Stunning, so they, yeah. It, it, yeah, so, so that's the true interpretation of, of, of Didatatis Humanae, right? So a Catholic can't accept that. A Catholic is not allowed to start believing that religious liberty is okay and that our Lord Jesus Christ is not king. You, you're not, that's not possible. So you're asking a Catholic to do something impossible, morally impossible. And the traditionalist was born from that impossibility. The, the inability to accept the new mass meant that you went and you set up a chapel, an uncanonical chapel. You didn't consult the ordinary. Why? Because the ordinary was inflicting the new mass. You, you couldn't even open the question with him. If you did open the question with him, and many people did initially, they found out, no, you're not having the old mass. Um, and the priests who asked to continue saying the old mass were either retired, sent out to the country, uh, you know, ignored, whatever, and they were forced to go wildcat too, you know. Um, so I've described that as a schism, which I firmly believe it was. But even aside from that technical term, the I think any position which, and, and, the, and the fraternity of St. Peter holds this view, that criticises the independence of traditionalists is taking the side of the innovators 
and the workers of violence, the tyrants, against the innocent Catholics of the day. That's what it's doing. Now, I'm not saying that every fraternity of St. Peter adherent or, you know, attendee or even priest thinks that and sees that is the implication of their position. But that is the implication of their position. That's the logical implication. By saying, oh, you shouldn't go to any mass not authorised by the bishop, you're saying those people did wrong. Mm. I got you. That makes so, sense. And I, I think <clears throat> that's, yeah, it makes sense. So, so I, and I think that's logically irrefragible. I don't think that argument, and no one ever addresses that argument because they can't, I think. So then let's move to the, let's consider the, the Society of Pius the 10th position is is essentially hold fast that which we've received and then, you know, not enter into the complicated problems, right? But don't try and solve the problem, theoretically, I mean, but just practically operate, right? So, so bring the Mass and the Sacraments. And that was what the Society was founded to do. Bring the Mass and the Sacraments, provide priests to those of the faith who are asking for them. So it's a, uh, a essentially pragmatic sort of answer to the problem and worked very well. Within the society, of course, you have theorists who will come out with, with, with uh, anti Senevacanus material or, you know, um, Bishop Williamson, when he was in the society, he used to put things out. You know, I remember one newsletter in which he, he theorised about how the Pope uh, can be head of two churches, a false church and a true church. I mean... Uh, and tried to flesh that out and explain why that's possible. Um, obviously, I don't agree with it, but that wasn't the society speaking. That was Bishop Williamson speaking. Um, so I think people who... And, and then, of course, people attacking the society call it recognise and resist. And I think that's that's wrong. That is a that is an incorrect summary of their position. It's They're not insisting on recognising... That's just the default, as you describe it. They see the default the way you see it. The default position is, well, he he's the Pope. Everybody says he's the Pope. We'll call him the Pope. And one day maybe the church will judge that he wasn't the Pope. But the safe position is just to accept, right? That, that's, that's it. But if you're looking for the rubber hits the road um, nature, you know, the, the essence of the SSPX position, it is the rejection of the new mass, the rejection of the errors of Vatican II, holding fast to that which were received. And that third one, that's what justifies everything else. You, if you're holding fast to what you've received because you're bound by it, then your position is humble, um, it's completely Catholic, and and it's 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 unable to be criticised, right? validly criticised. The reason I sort of go on about that a bit is because um, when I see attacks on the SSPX by some set of accountants, and it is a small number. I mean, they're quite prominent people, but they're a very small number. Most said a clergy never touch the SSPX, you know, and don't criticise others at all, really. They're, they're busy serving their flocks. But those those few loud spokesmen who attack that what they call the recognise and resist position, they are undermining the traditionalist position, including their own, in my view, because what they're saying, they say things like, if he's your pope, you must obey him. So go to the new mass. Now, if that's a valid principle, then no one had the right to get to, to retain the old mass in the beginning. You, you don't, you can't logically get to the set of accountants position unless you can reject the reforms first and then ask yourself, well, what's the source? Okay. You, you sort of say, yeah. What you'd have to do, Louis, is is say, uh, well, the only valid. The only lawfully, you know, lawful, truly Catholic attitude is is to go along with the reforms until you realise there, you know, there's something wrong. Then examine the claim to authority of, say, Paul VI. Decide that he's not Pope. And when you realise he's not Pope, then it's lawful to actually reject the reforms. I hear you. However, so it's this brings us back though to our earlier conversation about adherence. There is a fundamental disconnect present in the society's view. This man, Francis, is definitely the Pope. There's no question whatsoever that the society as a whole does not have a, a principle at play in which it encourages their faithful to adhere to the man as if he is Pope. Now, that is a departure from what's been handed down, isn't it not? I mean, it's 
it's a Catholic proposition that's been handed down throughout the centuries that we have this obligation to adhere to the man who is Pope. Yet the society does not do that. It openly does not adhere to the man. They don't treat him as Pope any more than the conservatives do, John. Wouldn't you say? No, no, I, look, I agree with that any more than the set of accountants do, really. Although that, this, this, that's changed a little bit in that they've now got the, um, the you know, he, he's granted them jurisdiction for confessions um, and he's granted them jurisdiction for uh, or faculties or whatever it is for, for marriages. Um, that I think the fundamental thing to see is that these men aren't acting like popes. So when, for instance, you know, People love to call us rad trads and say we're disobedient, schismatic, and all of that. And you go, well, okay, give me an example. And the new mass is a classic, right? Well, you know, you rejected the new mass. Everyone else accepted it. You guys rejected it. Little tiny rump, you know, bunch of rebels. Okay. Well, Samorum Pontificorum declared that the new mass had never been abrogated and that, and that we still had a right to it. So who had the law on their side? The tyrannical bishop who was saying, no, 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 Father, you can't say it. It's against the law, you know. No, well, that's not true. It wasn't against the law. He could continue to say it. He had every right to continue to say it. Likewise, the documents of Vatican II, you know, they're packed with error. But that error is not presented in the traditional doctrinal formulations of the church, uh, you know, in the same manner. And, and there are no anathemas you don't need anathemas necessarily, but it's it's worthwhile pointing out there are no anathemas. But not only there are no anathemas, those texts weren't treated as though you they were doctrinal law. No one's ever been accused of of failing to believe Vatican II and given a canonical trial, Louis. So you see what I'm saying? So there's no there's no true command there to believe this. And and even if you can find in the language of Vatican II somehow that command, you know, maybe the boilerplate at the end of the documents where it talks about, you know, and by the authority of the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul and our own, you know, we, we promulgate these docu you know, this document, whatever. But, but even so, their actions showed they didn't regard that they'd laid down something like Vatican I or the Council of Trent and that all Catholics, to be Catholic, had to adhere to this. I know they tyrannically talked like that, but they never made it. They never made anybody actually submit, right? Because to do that, you need to apply a canonical process to those who are dissident, right? Who, who won't accept, and they didn't dare do that. So I'm saying, what are we really disobeying in? Where are the commands we're disobeying? And and I, I just I don't know where they are, you know. So, John, one of the things, that though, that it, it does, but I, I, I still feel like the uh, the SSP exposition is you have a certain degree of peace with the society, which is fine. I don't want to disturb it. Yeah. However, <laughs> it does appear you, that, yeah, I doubt you will. that your position, however, is very much irreconcilable with the societies in, in a very basic way. I mean, we you, you mentioned the idea of the fraternity of St. Peter. And the, yeah. the risk, even though it may not be explicit, it's, it's strongly implied that they're lending credibility to those who attacked the faith by virtue of their treatment of the, the present uh, hierarchy in modernist Rome. Isn't the society doing the same thing? By, by referring to this man, Francis, as a holy father, they're legitimizing the person who is directly attacking the Catholic faith on a daily basis in real time today. So it seems like there's there's some tension between all, all of the thoughts and ideas that you've been kind enough to share with viewers and the position of the society. They're, they're in two very different places, aren't they? Well, they are in that sense that you know where they where they land in the in the concrete you know in the in the in the practical order to some degree, um, but you see, I I think of the set of counters position as logically following from their position. Right? So what I say is their true position is they are verbally acknowledging him, but they can't reduce it to act. They, they can't make it real. 
right? And it was a very interesting period back in, was it 2012, when, when Bishop Fallet looked like he'd do a deal. Um, and um, that disturbed the hell out of the society. And you go, well, why would that disturb you so much if he's the Holy Father and you're, you know? Good question. So, John, we're, we're on the very verge of running out of time. Just one quick question for you. Do you think there's a danger to the faithful involved in holding fast to that position that this man Francis is the Pope? Is that a dangerous proposition to feed to your faithful? Oh, look, I, th I think it's, um, yeah, I think it is. Uh, but it's not as dangerous. So, so danger should be assessed um, both theoretically and then practically, for instance. Um, you know, if you think about something that someone says is dangerous and you, you, you stop and go, hmm, okay, so, so when has the danger been realized? Look, what bad results has it produced, right? So, so you know, Bishop, Bishop Sanborn, for example, Donald Sanborn, has been predicting the society would do a deal with Rome and, and just become the fraternity of St. Peter, you know, uh, en masse for 30 years. But it's never happened. So you go, well, what's wrong with his analysis? Well, maybe theoretically it's hard to see a fault in the way he argues, but in practice it just doesn't seem to realise. And you go, why hasn't it realised? Um, so that's, uh, you know, I've been told, I was told... Um, I've been told for 20 something years now, um, you know, oh, if your kids grow up going to the SSPX mass, you know, they're going to think it doesn't matter whether he's Pope or not. And, you know, they, you're going to end up with sit a plainest kids and all this sort of thing. Well, uh, my wife's family of 10 grew up going to so-called unicorn masses and, and they all end up set of a cardus. Um, I don't see any sit a plainism in my house. So that danger sounds on the face of it plausible, but then, in practice, what actually happens? No, it doesn't seem to. That doesn't seem mm. to be what happens. You, you see what I'm saying? I do. That's so a good point. So the same thing with this. Yeah. So so that's all I'd say is that is that yeah. Look, I disagree with that. That um, it, it irritates me to be honest uh, to hear someone calling him Pope when he's such a monster and and he's such an implausible claimant. <laughs> um, and and. To, uh, I think their real view, and I look, I know a lot of these men and I've discussed it with them. Um, I think their real view is there's no plausible alternative theory. Uh, you know, the set of Akarnism equals the end of the church. And they're not asking, you know, they're not, they're not consulting me to find out the answers to these things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, why would, you know what I mean? That's ridiculous to even think about it. So, so they, they think, they think, oh, set of a card is, oh, that's the end of the church. They, that can't be right. And so what's the alternative, right? It, it's got to be these men have been popes. And how that is reconcilable with what's in the books from before Vatican II, I don't know. Above my pay grade. Now, back to offering mass and, and preaching and, you know. Yeah, theory, theory versus yeah. practice. Yeah, that makes that's that's a a good observation that should make sense to to everyone. Well, so John, we've reached the end here, so we're going to let our viewers off the hook and uh, invite them to come back next week. It's been a great discussion today. I personally enjoyed it very much. I think our viewers will as well. So looking forward to connecting with you next time, John. Thank you so much. No worries, Louis. Yeah, thanks for your time.